Okay, so I'll be talking about structure formation and layering. I intend not to do like the last two guys and I'll <laughs> try to give you some time to ask me questions. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see how it will work out. So um, I'll talk about two-dimensional turbulence and dissipative drift wave turbulence. So two-dimensional turbulence, why? Because I'm, to me, a poor man's way of looking at anti-diffusion is just the inverse cascade with some, you know, model for the small scales. If you do some closure on a system which has inverse cascade, you would get anti-diffusion in some sense. And I'll talk about dissipative drift wave turbulence because it generates zonal flows, layering, and staircases. So, but in 2D turbulence, I'll focus on 2D turbulence with patches which I call sporadic turbulence because it has certain characteristics. And spreading is an example of this kind of turbulence where you initialize a patch and then the turbulence spreads. Intermittency is a key signature, for example, of this kind of two-dimensional turbulence. Uh, and I'll talk about some structures that we observe in this kind of turbulence, which are called uh, Fleur-Stern Whitehead, so I'll call it FSW for simplicity, dipole vertex as the key structure which comes out of this uh, kind of turbulence. So I'll talk about formation of these, collusions among those, and I'll discuss if they self-organize. Then switch to dissipative drift wave turbulence, so basically the hasegawa wakatani model, which is an extension of the two-dimensional turbulence model, as a minimal model of this kind of turbulence, I'll discuss zonal flow formation, potential vertice staircase interpretation of this uh, resulting end state, and do some local linear analysis in this state to see how this structure is actually stable. And so I'll do some detailed analysis of this staircase. So the relevant papers for this is, for the first part, it's uh, this paper published in Journal of Physics A. And for the second part, actually, this is unpublished mostly, but uh, the code that you can see here is also introduced in this paper, so it's somewhat relevant to this discussion. So the sporadic 2D turbulence, I'll give you the example, as I said, of the initial condition with some patches of uh, broadband turbulence and see what this does. So we know that 2D turbulence, uh, we have the dual cascade, so it will selectively decay towards large scale structures. And if this was initialized with just broadband turbulence, we would maybe evolve towards the vertex, which is at the size of the box eventually, right? Because the inverse cascade doesn't stop until it reaches the box size until you have hypodiffusion, which would stop it at some point. So here the idea is the inverse cascade will not uh, compete against hypodiffusion. Here it will compete against sparsity. Like we have sparse uh, initial conditions. So in the end, what will happen is you could imagine like, we can concentrate on a given patch. This would do some inverse cascade and try to generate a vertex. And it would also spread at the same time. You, you could imagine maybe it's a competition between the spreading and the vertex formation. In fact, it's not a competition. It's rather a collaboration. So what happens is the vertex forms and the vertex helps the spreading by ballistic, ballistically moving around. So this is just uh, what happens if we run this in a simulation. So we generate a lot of these vertices. So I'll stop to focus on these objects. Like these are very clear dipole vertices that form. And they move with a particular speed and they usually rotate. And the rotation is given by the excess of the vorticity. So because they are not exact dipoles, there's an excess vorticity usually because why would they have exactly the same vorticity, and they interact, they collide, they do some funny things. So these kinds of behavior. Anyways, I'm not going to 
talks. So there are a lot of simulations that we can do in this because it's two dimensional uh, turbulence, it's really easy to do. <coughs> so, but the common wisdom in intermittency, like we can see that the turbulence that results is intermittent to the eye because it's uh, sparse in some places and so it has these structures in other places. But common wisdom is 3D turbulence is intermittent, but 2D turbulence is usually if you have homogeneous isotropic turbulence is not intermittent. There are counter examples of this from uh, experiments. And in simulations, we can actually force it in a particular way to get highly intermittent two-dimensional turbulence. This paper by the group of Alexakis is interesting, for example. They can induce intermittency in the inverse cascade of two-dimensional turbulence by fractal forcing. So fractal forcing is something you, you get actually exactly this kind of uh, resulting turbulence if you do fractal forcing. I'll, the results look very similar. But I think it's more interesting in some sense to look at uh, it from like initial conditions and decaying turbulence because it's more natural. So 2D turbulence in some sense can be extremely intermittent to non-intermittent depending on forcing or initial conditions. Here is the, my sort of look at uh, sporadic versus homogeneous turbulence. This is the exponent of the structure function defined uh, like this. This is the standard measure of intermittency in turbulence as a function of the order of the structure function. And if it's a straight line, it's non-intermittent. So homogeneous 2D turbulence is basically non-intermittent, whereas spor sporadic turbulence is intermittent. You can see it in the PDFs as well, like this. So 2D sporadic turbulence is significantly more intermittent. And it's this fact is a key signature of this kind of turbulence. And it can be tested, for example, in spreading scenarios. You could look at the PDFs to see if the turbulence spread by these kinds of vertices to that region. Uh, so the bugs in the end can be filled, but with sporadic turbulence, not the uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So let's focus now on the, the structure that we observed very clearly. So this is the um, FSW dipole vertex. It's, the, it's an asymmetric dipole that follows a phase-locked orbit around its origin of rotation. So it rotates like this with the, this side having always the same vorticity. So it's like the rotation of the moon around the Earth. It's actually a stationary solution in the rotating frame of the Euler equation, if you will, the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, without uh, viscosity, and it has a, a zero vorticity outside the vortex, and it satisfies this condition. This is actually a special case of the general class of solutions that are studied apparently by Chapelgin in the 1900s. It's an, an asymmetric generalization of the Chapelgin lamp dipole, and the solution can be written in this form. So, well, I'll Let's look at what these uh, things are. So this is the velocity of the vortex. This moves with some velocity. A is the radius of the di dipole. And these are some Bessel functions. It has this cosine theta structure in the, the rotating frame. And the epsilon is basically the ratio of the uh, uh, small radius, the minor radius to the major radius. And we can actually do detailed comparisons uh, of what we see in the simulations and fit actually with this object using this uh, form. And we observe that what we see are actually these vortices, exactly. So how do these form out of this initial you know, patches of turbulence. So they form actually, uh, we can study their formation using conservation of energy, entropy, and circulation inside the separatrices. So the two dipoles, we can calculate the circulation of each, and these are conserved quantities. So for example, I can start with two Gaussian initial conditions for the uh, stream function which are separated by a distance d. So this amplitude is plus or minus. Uh, 
and then the, the Gaussian basis <coughs> sigma. And from this, using these conservation laws, I can calculate the, the velocity of the dipole vortex, its uh, radius, and epsilon, which, uh, which is a measure of the imbalance as well as the rotation radius. So we can estimate these final parameters from the initial parameters. This is also true. I can do the same thing for a more complex initial condition. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian. So the conservation laws are still valid. But in general, I don't know how many of these dipole vertices will be formed out of the initial conditions. So once I can do that, I can actually... Um, so I need distinct separatrices if I can identify distinct separatrices and decide which two <coughs> poles will form a dipole, then I can actually use these conservation laws to, um, to separate the initial condition in terms of these dipole vertices. So in some sense, this is like a soliton um, inverse scattering problem. You have the initial condition and you're trying to divide it into these solitons. And these Objects are very similar to solitons because they are exact solutions of the system. They move at a certain speed proportional to their amplitude. And so in some sense, the resulting state is like a soliton gas state. And we can discuss collusions of solitons. So in this case, collusions of the dipole vertices. And viscosity acts as a friction. Uh, in this case, because these are exact solutions of the Euler equation, but not the Navier-Stokes equation. So we can predict actually how the, um, the evolution of that. So it works as a friction on the dipole vortex. So the velocity of the vortex will decrease in time as if there was friction acting on it. So this is, for example, uh, the numerical uh, observation of like if I start with two initial Gaussian uh, stream functions, how they form a <coughs> vortex initially, and then this is the velocity, the exact velocity that I predict, for example, with the separation, and then this is the, uh, the as a function of time, this kind of evolution with friction. So actually, once the vortex forms, it follows more or less this. Uh, prediction. So here's an example of how the vertex forms out of two Gaussian initial conditions. The initial condition is given here. Notice that the, one of the uh, stream function coefficients, let's say, of the Gaussian is different from the other, so we have a net vorticity. And in the end, because of the net vorticity, it would, once the dipole vertex forms, it rotates in the direction imposed by this excess of vorticity. And then you notice that you form a sort of secondary vortex out of the, the rim vorticity of the Gaussian. So the, because the Gaussian, when you take the second derivative, has a part which is sort of negative, and that part also forms, the, which we see like these rims here, and they form a vortex which is moving in the opposite direction. So we can look at the collusion of these objects. So this is, I initialized this time with exact uh, FSW vortices. So I know their trajectory exactly instead of Gaussians now. So I can put them in such a way they will collide, but their coefficients are different. So one, you know, like these are the coefficients, U, A, et cetera. So there's some slight difference. So when they collide, to see what will happen. Okay, they collide and they exchange their poles. And because of this asymmetry, they rotate in different directions and then they interact again. They do some grazing collusion, some, you know, all kinds of funny things. So, one thing that's interesting here is that we can actually model these collusions if they are a head-on collusion as using point vertices. So I can replace these poles 
with the effective uh, point <coughs> vertices, which have the same amount of uh, total circulation. And if I actually write down the evolution equations for these point vertices, I can describe, so here what we see is the first collusion that we saw in the previous movie, and the solid lines are what we predict from the point vertex approximation. So a head-on collusion is really nicely described by point vertices. However, we saw other collusions in that movie, which, wouldn't, which we wouldn't be able to describe using point vertices, especially things like tails or shear layers that form between vertices during these events. They wouldn't be described as point vertices. So a guess of point vertices may be not too bad, but it's not an adequate description of this kind of turbulence. So in some sense, as in the case of a soliton gas, it's important that these objects are nonlinear. They interact in a, in a way which, which is also nonlinear. Um, so the conclusion for this part is that there exists a transitory, but uh, as the discussed uh, in this paper, we can actually force the system with the fractal forcing and generate this kind of turbulence. Again, state of 2D incompressible turbulence. So with extreme intermittency, that we call sporadic turbulence to distinguish from the usual 2D homogeneous isotropic turbulence. This is dominated by dipolar nonlinear vorticity structures and making detailed compa comparisons to their analytical forms, we find that these are FSW dipole vertices. And basically, I make a summary here. <coughs> Using energy, estrophy, and circulation conservation, we can <coughs> estimate that this dipole vortex that would be formed from an initial perturbation. So collusions among dipoles result in other dipoles, almost like solitones. They seem to be somewhat robust. It seems that a large dipole can destabilize a strong shear layer, but can dipoles somehow how organized to form a shear layer? So I told, I told that I will talk about their self-organization. So here is a, an idea about uh, how they could self-organize. So this is in some, in some sense a mechanism in search of its problem. Uh, now imagine the velocity field that is uh, perturbed in this form. And this, this means the, the velocity of the structures is downward here and upward here mostly, so this is a sort of statistical sense. And if they are downward here, so this velocity field would imply a vorticity field of this form, it's just a derivative of that. And so if we have a negative vort vorticity, uh, net vorticity, this would be deflected this way, whereas if we have a positive net vorticity for the dipole, it would be deflected this way. Okay, now, so this would increase the vorticity here, decrease, then decrease the vorticity here, let's say. Well, of course, what we saw in the motion of these dipole vortices, they would just rotate and come back around. So this is not going to really give me anything, unless they are somehow absorbed by some some other mechanism by the shear layer that would form in between. So in some sense, this needs uh, some kind of conspiracy, but it could happen. Uh, so let's see, how about dissipative drift waves? Do we have anything like that in dissipative drift waves? Uh, so the, for describing dissipative drift waves, I use this uh, equation, which is the hasegawa wakatani equation. Pat uh, described uh, this in his talk. Consists of an equation of vorticity and an equation of continuity, so density. And the reason that it's written with these tildes is that, so I def the tilde is defined as the deviation from the average. And you can see that if we if you calculate in your head the averages of these two equations, so the mean equation in some sense, you would get the equation for the zonal vorticity and the zonal density, and it would these terms with tildes would cancel from the, the, that equation, so you would have just the zonal vorticity driven by the uh, Reynolds stress in some sense, and zonal density driven by the net uh, <coughs> uh, particle flux. 
so the kappa term that we have here is equivalent to the beta term that we would have in the charney hasegawa mima system. So this is a minimal non-trivial model in the sense that it has waves, it has a linear instability, unlike the charney hasegawa mima system, and it forms zonal flow. So this is, in that sense, it's the minimal possible model that you can think of. It has two limiting behavior, which we call the adiabatic limit, the C goes to infinity. In that limit, we obtain the charney hasegawa mima system and the hydrodynamic limit, in which case the two equations decouple, and you have a two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation, and the passive scalar evolution equation. So, it, but for any C in some sense, we can define a critical wave number, which is C over kappa, uh, for which if uh, the, the system would be hydrodynamic for scales that are larger than Kc, and would be adiabatic for scales that are smaller than Kc. And this we see in some sense here, this is, this is the results of simulations for C equals one, kappa equals one. So one is here in some sense. And uh, the unfortunate thing about this equation is you have no flexibility in terms of where you inject energy. So the energy injection is almost always around 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, something like that. You can make a scan of C and kappa, and the, very, the energy injection varies from 1.5 to 0 0.8 or something. So doesn't, you always inject energy at around 1. But we see the adiabatic part of the system here, which gives us the zonal flaws. So this is the zonal energy spectrum, which goes like this, and then is the dominant part here. This is the non-zonal component, which goes like k to minus 3, so basically hydrodynamic. So we can also see that from some color pictures, and I'll show you also a movie of that. Uh, so here are the zonal flows that will form eventually in the system. And so, and within these zonal flows, if we zoom into one of these regions, we see something that we are familiar with. This looks like standard two-dimensional Navier-Stokes turbulence in some sense. So small scales, 2D Navier-Stokes, large scales, layering and zonal flows. So, uh, wait, I should have clicked on that so that it would open the TV. So, we see now how the system evolves in time. So we will first see some waves appearing, moving upwards, and then the system will become nonlinear. So it becomes unstable to modulational instability in some sense. It generates some zonal flows. And at some point we see the black line that we see in both of these curves is the zonal flow velocity. And that we can also observe by the movement of the structures in some sense. So you can see that it's rich, but it reaches a steady state in some sense for the zonal velocity, which is reasonably stationary. So it wiggles around, but it doesn't really change much. And another thing we are supposed to look at is the evolution of the structures. Like you can see some vertices in some sense here, like this is two-dimensional turbulence at small scales. But do we see that mechanism, for example, that I was talking about, the formation of dipole vertices and dipole vertices of different sizes moving in different directions? Well, not so much. What we see are actually what I would call elliptic vertices, like these are sort of like Kirchhoff vertices in some sense that are rotating because of the additional shear, so they are um, what people also call Kida vertices, Kirchhoff vertices in the presence of large shears. So these are the kinds of vertices that we see that rotate in, in between these shear layers. And now we can see actually towards the end of the simulation, the, uh, the zonal flow profile looks extremely stationary for the system. So it's very, steady state in that sense. 
You don't need to average this over anything. It just uh, sits there, continues like this. Okay, I'm not going to wait until the end. So um, here is the profile of what we can call the Hasegawa Watatani potential vorticity staircase. So the potential vorticity for this system is the difference between the density and the vorticity. So if I plot that as a function of uh, radius in the system, you can see that the, so this N0x is the background uh, density and it has a large gradient which is defined by kappa, so similar to the beta story. And what we see here is flattening in regions where we see the peaks of the um, zonal flow profile. Now, why is that? The, the reason is the zonal flow profile implies a vorticity gradient, actually. So these peaks here have negative vorticity gradients because it's the derivative of the velocity. So the second derivative of the velocity implies a first derivative of the vorticity. So here we have, every time we see a flat region, we actually have a, a vorticity gradient. And this is together with the density gradient. So the, the density corrugations also appear, but uh, it's actually, the, the effect of density gradient is smaller for this particular problem, I must say, than the vorticity gradient. Because actually, as we will see in the next picture, there are actually two types of steps in this profile. One type of step which appear because of the vorticity gradient, and the other type of smaller step that we see here here, which corresponds usually to the minima of the, uh, of the zone of flows here, uh, which is because of the density gradient. In fact, this is, uh, if you paid attention to Min Jun's talk, he showed a, um, a picture from Guillaume de Predalier, which was actually because of the pressure gradient. The, the steps would be because of the pressure gradient flattening, and in that case, the peaks, the, the peaks correspond to uh, jumps in the, uh, the pressure gradient. So I don't know, I can, can discuss this in more detail. So here is the profile of the zonal, zonal flow. And here is the profile of the dance, density. And in green, I show the, uh, the vorticity gradient. So here we see, sort of calculated as a constant uh, in different regions. So we see that vorticity gradient is a negative whenever we have a peak, and okay, it's positive, but weaker whenever we have a well. But in each well, we see a density gradient, which is positive, like this, whereas in Around peaks, the density gradient is more or less flat. So the wells have a density gradient that's positive, and positive density gradient opposes the density gradient in the background. So the background density gradient is negative in some sense. So um, if we compute the local growth rate from this picture using a local linear analysis of the equations that we see, we can define the gamma is a function of x, which would include the vorticity gradient and the density gradient that we have. So gamma is increased in regions of large shear because whenever we have a shear, because the density has to be continuous, goes up in this region, it has to go, up, go down in the shear region, and the same thing here. So whenever we have a shear, so a linear profile of the uh, zone of flow, we have a negative density gradient, which actually increases the linear growth rate. So but what does linear growth rate has to do with anything? We can actually define this linear growth rate as a function of position and compute it in the profile of the uh, zone of flow step. So the point is, 
Now I can define four different regions, actually three different regions really. So one is the valve where the growth rate decreases a little bit. So B has a smaller growth rate as opposed to, for example, the region C. So in this region, the growth rate goes up even from the initial growth rate that we have, which would be the average of that. So in the peak region, the growth rate drops to zero. So there's no local growth rate here. And in the next shear region is exactly the same as the other shear region. So this analysis is possible because actually I don't need to consider scale separation because the most unstable node is always kx equals zero, so I can separate x and y and do the analysis in x. Um, so how does the this staircase work? So we can look at the the way this functions as a steady state staircase using the i coronal approximation. Pat also talked about that, this a little bit. The idea is if you have a wave packet, the wave packet moves with the group velocity and its wave number is modified uh, by the shear as a function of time. And we can define for this problem a sort of uh, frequency. So this is the solution, let's say, of the dispersion relation. Can always be written in this form, but uh, if you want i delta k to be small, c has to be a little bit large. In any case, if you take the group velocity, it's proportional to minus 2kx because of this uh, 1 over k square here. And so the most unstable nodes have ky equals 0. So <coughs> even, for example, in this region, we would generate modes which are only in the KY direction, so they would be propagating only upwards. But nonetheless, if there is shear in that region, even if it's small, the shear, because of this evolution, would actually increase the KX as a function of time proportional to the shear and the KY. So which makes, which tilts basically the, the structure that we have initially. And the tilting, of course, if I put the structure here where the shear is negative, it would be tilted the other way around. And this makes it the group velocity in this direction. So this wave packet, in some sense, starts moving in this direction. And as it moves, it goes into a region with larger shear. So it gets sheared apart even more. And then at some point, it becomes like this. And it's the same story here. And this kind of thing, actually, if we go back to the movie, I don't know, not that much back. I think the movie was here. I'll just uh, move a little bit uh, further in time. This kind of thing we actually observe. This is the, the formation of very elongated sort of structures that are in the shear layer. You see these sort of things that, that get sheared apart. Uh, they get radial almost to their wave number. So in some sense, you see the mechanism somehow in there, even though it's not clear if this mechanism is really explains everything about this problem. So my conclusion to this, this part is Okay, Hasegawa Wakatani turbulence forms a PV staircase structure which consists mainly of zonal flows. This is different from, let's say, corrugation dominated staircases which consists mainly of uh, pressure gradients or pressure profile flattening. In this case, it's the vorticity that uh, generates the zonal flow uh, or the staircase. The resulting turbulence state is all of flows at large scale and 2D turbulence in small scales. So we can do some local linear stability analysis, which suggests peak of zonal flow profiles are stable. This is sort of where the PV homogenization happens, while valves have moderate and shear layers have increased local growth. And increased growth at the shear layers is balanced locally by shear decorrelation. So in the end, the system can stay stable because you, you stabilize the region where uh, 
the potential vorticity is flat, and the, the region where the shear layer uh, is uh, important, the, the growth, local growth is balanced by high shear decorrelation. So icono theory can be used to describe the state of SOC equilibrium in some sense. And there are two types of steps in this uh, kind of staircase. One is due to vorticity gradient and the other is due to density gradient. And this, in the case of asegawa wakatani turbulence, I must say, the vorticity gradient steps dominate. Uh, so in the end, we have a vorticity gradient driven uh, staircase. So there are multiple open questions in this problem. First one is uh, mentioned also in previous talks, the emergent scale of the zonal flow width. So the zonal flow width in this problem is not clear at all because if, we, if you go back to my K spectrum, uh, the spectrum that I had was K to minus three. So in this case, we inject energy at large scales in some sense around one, and the entropy cascade is forward. So it's not the inverse cascade that somehow stops uh, at some scale, but it's a forward cascade of entropy. And the zonal flow appears right around the scale of energy injection. So, but it's not exactly at that scale either. So it's a harder problem in that sense. Um, and the intermittency and the dominant structure of these kinds of uh, turbulence is something that we should study in more detail. So, for example, the presence of dipole or elliptic vertices in rot uh, rotating with the sheared flow is an interesting observation that we see. So, in this system, again, there are no mergers, so, and avalanches don't seem to be present. So, the question of relevance to fusion plasmas remain, and I stop for questions. We do have uh, some time. Uh, other questions? Um, so in the beginning, when you showed your, the exponent dimension in structure functions, mm, yeah. um, at what time, because you, you're having a time dependent problem, at what time did you measure them? Yeah, I wait until the system is reasonably not changing so much. I mean, basically, I start. And when we enter this state, I compute. So I make some average over this part of the time. But it's true that it's a decaying turbulence problem. So it's not. Uh, but the same thing I did also for homogeneous turbulence. So it's also decaying turbulence. So I basically, the idea is to compare the two. And if I'm making an error in the, the way I calculate, I do it in both in some sense. So forgive me for pooping the party and mentioning something fusion relevant. But have you uh, have you at all investigated the fate of the staircases that you're studying uh, as you scan adiabaticity from adiabatic to strongly non-adiabatic? In other words, alpha passing through unity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing you, you is... you know why that's relevant before you go on? That, that's, that's it, there's, it there's experiments strongly linking that to the density. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the... Now, there are some particular details about the way I run this model, and so maybe I should explain that a little bit. So, in this case, there is no zonal flow damping. So... The, the fact that you see the steady state at the end is clear. In some sense, it's clear that there's no zone of flow damping. So it makes it less relevant to fusion in that sense. But it makes it more clear in terms of studying the staircase because you don't have this additional parameter. So uh, in, in that sense, the, my final state is an unlinear solution of the problem because it's, in fact, if you look at the equations, uh, if you put a one-dimensional flow in the system because of the form of the Poisson bracket, you, ha you have an exact solution. So anything which becomes one-dimensional is a solution of the problem. 
And so, um, in that sense, when I do some scans of uh, C and kappa, basically what I observe is the zonal flow strength changes, obviously, as you go to small C, there are no zonal flows, and if you crank up C, there are more zonal flows. But this is sort of expected. Well, I mean, what's the precise crossover? And forgive me, it would be interesting to restore some simple zonal flow damping and to do those scans in that case. Yeah, that, that's why I mentioned uh, this particular. It's of great relevance, right? And, yeah. and the obvious thing in layering with these staircases. Well, we are at an institute of mathematics, so <laughs> I think I'm fine. And you, you get some. <laughs> you will be seeing that in York. You will be seeing that in York. All right, good. Nice to know you caught on. <laughs> so out of curiosity, so in the beginning, when you show us those videos, you release a lot of vortex fields to know what controls the size and the strength of those vortex, those vortex fields. So the initial conditions, of course, in my case, I mean, because of the way I initialize a system, usually the, this would divide into a few vertices. And the, so, I mean, if you pay attention, there's a scale in this initial condition. So it's not completely scale independent initial condition. So this initial scale sort of uh, defines some modulation scale in that uh, region. And that basically defines how the, the vertices are going to form. But it's sort of like you need to really zoom in and calculate, like you, you look at this part where you have a red region and a blue region, and if you can calculate the sort of circulation in that region, that basically forms a vortex very rapidly. But, I mean, it's a, uh, then the collusions and, you know, the evolution gives some, more complicated dynamics, but I agree that the, my initial conditions define the, the the vertex in some sense. Now, just ask about your limits, um, Oscar. You had you, so your c equals naught. The equations become decoupled, right? Mm, yeah. And when c goes to infinity, what happens then? Like so when c goes to infinity, because uh, this is infinity equals not infinity, you need to just subtract the two equations from one another and take this thing that's inside to be equal to zero, because otherwise you can't, uh, there's no way to satisfy that equation. So basically phi becomes equal to n, and it's the difference of the two equations that uh, become your equation in some sense. And if you calculate the difference with uh, replacing n by phi, you get actually the Hasegawa-Mima equation, or charney hasegawa mima equation. Well, and the, and the, the anisotropy in your solution, that's, that's just because of the density, density gradient, is it? It's yes, this, uh, this kappa term, which comes from the background density gradient, so it's like the beta term. I don't, I could put a background vorticity gradient as well, but it's not necessary, the vorticity gradient develops. And part of the reason, again, in this problem, it's vorticity gradient that dominates and not the density gradient is the issue of inertia, vorticity, zonal flows as less inertia than zonal corrugations in some sense. So I just want to get in a quick question. When you, when you scan, uh, you call it C, I call, everyone else calls it alpha. But when you scan alpha down, do you see the growth of density blobs? Um, uh, well, I could show you some simulations of that, uh, what happens. What happens is it looks like very sort of standard 2D turbulence rather than density blob. But I don't have interchange here. Blobs. Interchange, you know, usually you need interchange. I, I disagree with the, the I, I mean, interchange helps, but I disagree with the, with the necessity. 
about that. We can look at to, uh, it together and if you want. Very uh. clearly, in these density limit things, when you go down in adiabaticity, you have the, the counter propagating blobs and voids appears, and it's correlated with the spreading. Okay, well, we can, I think, look at it together if you want. Uh, let me squeeze in one. Uh, rather than always going in pairs, uh, do you see in the interest of layering um, a possibility that you get a natural segregation of vorticity? So vorticity of certain types go one way. So, I mean, this, these things depend on your initial conditions, of course. The 2D turbulence is so versatile, you can sort of initialize it in a particular way, you get some particular solution. You, you see that not as an initial value problem, but yeah, you in a don't. developed turbulent state. In 2D turbulence, no. Standard 2D turbulence, you wouldn't get layering. There's no reason for for this kind of thing. So you need something to break the symmetry of some sort. Well, thank you very much, Oscar.